Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Modern Trade Communications webinar series. I'm Paul Deffenbaugh. I'm the Editorial Director at Modern Trade, and uh, we're the publishers of Metal Architecture Magazine and Metal Construction News. Thanks for joining us today. We're presenting the Metal Roof Basics for the Architect as part of our webinars, webinar series, and uh, we're glad you've joined us. Before I turn over the reins to Chuck Howard, who is our expert instructor today, let's take care of a few housekeeping duties. Chuck's got a lot of material that he wants to go through here today, so we're going to hold questions until the end. Uh, you can submit questions in the window on your screen. I think you can find it there. I'll monitor questions, and if there is an important clarification that needs to be made, I'll bring it up. Chuck said interrupt him if, if necessary. Um, we'll provide you with a copy of, of the presentation about an hour after the webinar is over. You're going to get a link and an email as part of our follow-up. Uh, that will have information uh, about what you need to do for continuing education units for AIA or how to get a certificate of completion. Um, and you'll have links there so you can download the slides and a link to the presentation which will be posted on our video section on the Metal Architecture website. That'll take about a day or so to get that up. Uh, the email only goes to people who attended, so if you're part of a group sitting in a conference room, have the person who registered follow up on all those matters for you and communicate it and we'll get it through to you that way. Our slide, our, our presentation today is sponsored by Firestone Building Products. Um, I want to thank them for their support of the industry and, and their devotion to uh, improving the knowledge and education of all the industry's participants. They've been a, a big asset for us in our webinar series, and we certainly do appreciate them. Um, this slide is, uh, we're registered providers with AIA, and this course is certified. This gives you a little bit of information about the course and, and the certification process. And this is our course description, which is another required slide for the AIA credits. Um, it summarizes the course. You can refer to it later. You probably saw in the email we sent out earlier um, if you want to know more about what you're about to learn. And here are the learning objectives for the course today, the four uh, ideas that Chuck has put forward that he wants to make sure you uh, understand. He's going to hit on all these points as part of his presentation. Um, Chuck Howard is with us today. Chuck is a professional engineer and he's a member of the Metal Construction Hall of Fame. He was the very first person to design and install a metal roof retrofit, I believe, and he's done a boatload of them since that very first one. He's going to talk to you a little bit about that in the course of his presentation. Um, over the course of his career, Chuck's written dozens of articles in, in a lot of different trade magazines. You can see one of his most recent ones in Metal Architecture in the May 2016 issue. And he's also presented hundreds of seminars all over the country, so I'm excited to have someone with his experience on board today. Now I'm going to turn over the presentation to Chuck, and he is going to take things up. Chuck, take it away. Okay. Paul, can everybody, uh, can you see the introduction uh, only screen? I can't yet. Have you accepted the presentation? Yeah. Wait a minute. I need to do that first. Okay, just a minute. There we go. You see it's a full page now? You're good. Okay. All right. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for attending. As, as Paul said, I appreciate him uh, asking me to do this. I uh, love to talk about metal roofing anytime uh, I get a chance. Uh, I always say I like to do these seminars and webinars in this particular case uh, in a manner that would be interesting to me if I were a participant. And so I'm trying to do that uh, to everybody that's on the uh, webinar at this point. And we're going to talk about metal roofing. I'll make it as interesting as, as I can. I'm very, you'll find out I'm very passionate about it, and hopefully that will come across in the, uh, in the information. First of all, um, let's skip through these. I'm sorry, I had this up. There we go. Uh, uh oh, went the wrong way. Sorry, I'm just getting used to the area. This is who I am now. I'm uh, I am a civil engineer, as Paul said. Uh, I'm a professional engineer in, in multiple states in the in the United States and worked all over the United States and and uh, and Canada, uh, mainly doing metal roofing. That's what I've been doing for over 40 years. 
Um, I have uh, about 35 million. I'm not saying this to brag by any means, but I've just got a lot of experience as I tell people. The reason I can talk about this uh, is that I've made more mistakes than anybody else, and I've paid attention. So uh, we've got a lot of this out uh, there, new roofs and uh, retrofit roofs, um, uh, probably about 50-50 uh, as far as percentage-wise. So I've been dealing with this uh, as um, I did the first metal roof in 1973, and it's still in service. Uh, I've been a consultant uh, for the last almost 20 years now. Uh, I was a contractor for a long time, had a lot of people. We did uh, installations ourselves. So I come to you not only as a designer, but also as uh, somebody who was responsible for getting them installed, which uh, we, we can design them, but we also have to get them installed properly. So uh, I, hopefully I can bring uh, add a little perspective to that as we go through. I uh, also do expert witnessing, legal assistance, um, uh, with, uh, if there are some roofs that have some problems while we get called in uh, to, do, to do a lot of those. So that's kind of who I am, so you've got a feeling for uh, this is going to be a very practical, as I said, seminar uh, and not, um, uh, not a lot of lecturing by any means. So I'll give you some slides. Hopefully you can come back and use these at your, at your leisure if you, if you need them in your business. And you also have a link for my um, uh, website at, the, uh, at our website at the end of this. Uh, and feel free to contact me if uh, you have or our company if you have any uh, any questions at all or anything we might be able to do to help you. That's the only sales pitch you're going to get today. All right. First of all, new metal roof designs. Um, it's it's very simple. On the right side here, normally this is what we have is we we'll have a metal deck with we'll rigid insulation and you put a metal panel on top of it. Now it looks real simple. There's only three or four main components that we have in that. But as you can see on the left slide here. Uh, this is a 420,000 square foot uh, airport we did uh, in Raleigh, Durham. Uh, stainless steel, continuous panels, longest panels, 435 feet long, uh, with a lot of uh, areas we had a, a expansion contraction that were conflicting, and um, and and so it takes more than just the roof deck insulation and uh, and panels. We have to, a lot of things to take into account with uh, with a metal roof. But what we're going to talk about today is I'm going to give you the basics of it. It's what we talk. So we talk about the basics, and then hopefully you'd have enough information that would help you uh, when you got into large projects like uh, like this. Um, this is a, this is the Tampa Airport roof that also that uh, we were involved with, and it's a Southwest terminal. This happens to be aluminum and stainless, instead of stainless steel. It's because of aluminum, you can see the expansion joint in the middle of it because we couldn't handle all that expansion. Um, uh, from the eave to the ridge. So anyway, these are just some examples of the new uh, new roofs, and all of these had to be specified. All of them had to be bid. All of them had to be administered in the field to make sure that they got installed right. Uh, when we talk about retrofit, this is a job done locally here in North Carolina. It was uh, a 110 foot tall um, uh, prison uh, dormitory. The last the top three floors were not used for the last I think 20 or 25 years because the roof leaked so bad, and nobody knew how to put a roof on it. So we came in a very simple process, and I'll go through this a little bit later in the in the seminar, uh, in the webinar, and um, and show you a little bit more about this. But in general, what we do is we put a small metal building on top of of the roof with light gauge framing, uh, and put another a metal roof on it. So we turn now they're using this entire prison wing, and we've got a new metal roof. And I'll talk to you later about how long it should be expected to to last. But it's a permanent roof that'll last as long as a on our building will. So, so we don't have to walk away from jobs when, as a designer, and you don't as architects, as designers, uh, when they have bad roofs on them, there's a way that we can put a permanent roof on them using the metal roof design. Chuck, I'm going to interrupt you for a moment. Your, your screen is not on full size, full view yet. So we're seeing uh, just a, a portion oh, of really? the fly. Or, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, mine is I'm on Getting mine. that information from somebody in the audience. Uh, okay. Sorry. Just keep uh, that. And so I'm on this. Keep talking, and I'll I'll work on it in the background. Sorry to interrupt you. Keep okay. Going. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, so anyway, the the metal roof designs, as we we talk about those a little uh, again. Um, this is uh, a community college shows the flat roof that we did they they had to start with and um, afterwards we ended up adding pitch and sloping it both ways and putting a metal ended up with a metal roof on the top of it I'm not selling uh, our services I'm just saying that that can be done you don't have to uh, continue to put a flat roof in a in a flat roof section 
um, you, you do have the possibility, and, and, and we'll talk about that, uh, to add pitch to it. Our agenda today is we're going to talk about the ingredients for a good metal roof. We're going to talk about some specifications, uh, building code requirements, metal panel profiles, uh, the difference between hydrostatic and hydrokinetic, which gets overlooked a lot. Um, we're going to do those. Um, we're going to go through Galvalim coating. Uh, and go through the warranties, uh, the um, paint warranties, Galvalim warranties, and weather tightness warranties. Those are real critical in our industry. As you can see, we're not going to do everything, but we're going to hit the subjects that I feel get neglected a lot of times in our specifications. We're going to talk about pre-construction meetings, um, the roof, uh, the installation is extremely important. You can't just turn it over to anybody to do this. And then we're going to talk a little bit about retrofit. We've got a slide on life cost analysis, which I think you'll find very interesting uh, with metal roofing. And then we're going to show up some pictures at the end of, uh, of some finished, uh, finished metal roofs. So um, that said, um, well, let's get into it. I don't know if we're still looking at, at the uh, a smaller picture here. And I apologize if we are. I'm not sure exactly how uh, how to fix it, but Paul's working on it in the in the background. <clears throat> All right. We're going to first thing. We got ingredients of a uh, of a good metal roof. Uh, you know, I don't know say a great metal roof because uh, everything has to be done properly uh, from design through installation. And, and so uh, we want we want to do is make sure we get a good responsible metal roof. Uh, uh, and the end product for our owners. Um, what makes a good roof? Um, this happens to be a roof that um, uh, is uh, about 35 years old uh, that has a gavelume coated panel on it. It's 110,000 square feet and it's a good metal roof. It's got a few units on it. Uh, it's got some laps in it because of the length of the panels. But it can be installed properly where it will, will, will service it, the, the, an industrial application ex extremely well. Um, so what makes a good roof? You're going to have to have experience and practical designer. That's where um, where your architects uh, can help a lot. It has to be laid out to where it's actually we're going to use, um, uh, we're, we're going to do the things that we know can be done in the field that will make this thing a good uh, substantial roof for the, uh, for the owner. First of all, we have to use a quality manufacturer. Um, we have to use an experienced contractor. Those two have to go together. We have to have a manufacturer that knows what he's doing in the industry. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of small ones. There's a lot of big ones. Some of them aren't good quality uh, because they're just uh, out selling tons of steel. Uh, and and so we need to have somebody that's really, and there's several of them out there. It's not like we, we have a, a shortage of them. But we have to make sure that it's somebody that can do what we want to do, whether it's a house, it's a church, it's an industrial building, uh, it's a school, whatever it happens to we have to make sure we got a, a contract, a manufacturer that can supply that, and then we have to have the experienced contractor. And I say this all the time: the final quality is determined by the contractor, not the architect or the manufacturer. Uh, pan metal panels have been around since 1932; uh, they've been around a long, long time. Contractors have been around a long time. Architects and engineers have been around a long time. But we got to put that together, and the person that touches it last is the contractor. And we have to make sure that we've got somebody in there that knows what he's doing uh, in that. Uh, in this in that segment, we need to have independent inspections. Uh, I'll talk about these a little bit later, but at least three. We're going to have to have some independent people looking at it to make sure that we uh, uh, that we're getting everything installed right. And we have to have owner involvement. Usually, you don't see that, but it's their roof. Uh, it's the owner's roof. A lot of times, there'll be uh, you know, especially school systems. It's uh, they live with this roof. They have kids underneath of it. They've got uh, gymnasium floors underneath of it. It's really, really important that they get uh, a good roof, and we as specifiers have to make sure that we, um, that we give them that. And uh, that means not only choosing a metal roof to start with, but also making sure that we've got all the, the, the uh, practical things that we're talking about here from a quality manufacturer, experienced contractor, independent inspections. We have to make sure that they're getting what they need, cause they, and so they need to be involved. They're the ones that's going to live with it. We're, uh, we're not. They're going to be the ones that have to live with it. Okay, here's some of the basics, and I'll go through these in more detail in a minute, but we're going to have to figure out a profile of the panel. We're going to have to figure out how it's going to be attached. 
we're going to figure out what kind of warranties we want. And normally they're in the 20 to 20 plus years for all of them. But on the weather tightness, tightness especially, we have to establish some things. The liability limit, are there going to be inspections? And all these have to be clearly identified in the specifications. Or you'll go back and you'll pay changes for them. Or if you don't do it to start with, the manufacturer will walk away from it because, uh, because we didn't have it clearly uh, identified in the specs to start with. And they'll give you a 20-year warranty, but it may, not ha it may have very low uh, liability limits that are exceeded uh, when they come out and do their inspections. So, so there's a lot of things we have to think about with those. We'll go through those in more detail. Manufacturer, you only need three or four. We don't need a list of 25, and some of them meet the specs and some of them don't. Choose it. Take your time and go through it and choose your manufacturers that you want for this particular project. They need to have certified installers and they need to offer a weather tightness warranty. Uh, most of the stuff we do is in the public uh, arena. Uh, and so we have to have the weather tightness warning. Private arena, you don't need it, but you certainly want a warrantable product. You don't expect the roof to leak, so you want to have it installed in a manner that it, uh, that it won't leak. Uh, it's a structural element of the building. I say that over and over in articles and seminars I do and webinars I do. It has to be, it's a structural element of the roof. It's something that has to satisfy the local building codes. Uh, the IBC specifically talks about metal roofing and tells you exactly what you need to do and what uh, the what you're supposed to use to um, uh, to make sure that the structural uh, capacity is satisfied. And you need to use a fee, uh, PE that's familiar with the metal. It doesn't have to be doesn't have to be in the original specification, but has to specify in there that it's going to have to be designed. Uh, by the manufacturer or by the contractor or by an independent engineer it's designed before uh, before it does get installed so anyway um, those are now technical specifications first of all I'm going to go through in the, in the technical specifications we have to list what the IBC requirements are we got the uh, international building code uh, uh, it's going to identify those it's been accepted in all the states uh, sometimes there's minor re, uh, revisions uh, I haven't seen any state that makes any revisions, and I, I, I may be uh, cor incorrect, and please send me if, uh, if I am, if there are some states, but I haven't, we've been in a lot of states, and I haven't seen any states that takes any exception to, uh, uh, to this. The metal roof is a structural element of the building, and because of that, uh, a PE must perform a design analysis. You can be done in the shop drawing phase. Again, it just uh, it doesn't have to be done uh, prior to it, and personally, I don't like it done prior to it because uh, prior to the construction phase because you're not sure which manufacturer and which contractor may get the project and all of them will look at it just a little bit differently. Uh, so we want to make sure that the final uh, design done in the shop drawing stage is signed by a PE uh, that's licensed in the state where the work is done. Um, and retrofit, this is one of the IBC, it's, it's actually in the IBC and retrofit work, you can put a metal retrofit roof over two existing roofs as long as you use a light gauge steel framing uh, system that loads the existing structure. So they don't care if, if you take it off and if it's too wet, there's, uh, we can't, don't have enough time to get into all the, the times that they possibly may need to be taken off. But the majority of them, um, if, if there's two, they have to be taken off. Usually the energy code requires then that you come back with, uh, with the, uh, the, new, uh, the new energy requirements and tapered insulation. And when you get into that, then you're going to get into a, a, a situation that's going to be uh, as costly or more costly in some cases than putting a retrofit roof over that. So, but retrofit is in the IBC, and it tells exactly what you can do with that. Uh, these are the two main things that I look for uh, in in the IBC that re, that um, helps us and requires us to do the design for a metal roof. One of them is the ASCE 7, and by the current edition, that's identified by whichever IBC has been accepted in the, the state that you're working in. And that will determine your wind loads for all the roof areas. There's uh, five of them, and there's, there's wall areas that we have to design for, too. Uh, so we have to uh, evaluate all that stuff, and that takes an engineer to, uh, to do that, to come up with the, how you convert the, the wind loads into, uh, into design loads. And then also, uh, we've got, then we have to go to figure out what panel we need to specify. We need to be specific with the panel we're going to specify. And uh, to do that, we have to use the ASTM. We'll miss an S there, I see the ASTM E1592 um, uh, test, and that determines the structural capacity of the metal panel to resist the design loads. So we design loads first, then will the panel resist those uh, design loads. Uh, and all, uh, all panels, we just put it in the specifications right up front, that they have to have a panel that has been tested by an ASTM E1592. Um, and then, then that's how we actually would do the design to make sure that the panel would, would work in our uh, locations. 
metal panel profiles. The next thing we need to do is we need to find out what metal panel profile that we're uh, that we're we're going to we're going to use. Now, four of the most uh, common ones, even though um, uh, most of these aren't common in um, in the public uh, arena, they are in some of the industrial arena. This is the old R panel, which we've all seen before. It's a 36 inch wide panel. It's usually in 26 gauge, and it's got major corrugations every um, every 12 inches, and then some minor minor ones at four inches on center or thereabouts. And it's a through fastened roof. So, so the panels lap over each other, and then where the supports are, we put fasteners in the roof and fasteners along the, the seam. So it's a through fastened roof. It's fixed to the roof. When it goes to expand and contract, uh, on, especially on long runs, uh, you can have some problems with the fasteners backing out and things like this because we don't handle expansion and contraction. Where, uh, we, we, uh, you know, so it's, 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 it can move. The panels can move, and they can't elongate the, uh, the holes in that particular case because we haven't allowed it to expand and contract in any given direction. You'll see that's different with uh, some of the concealed fasten ones. But it's used on smaller buildings, on some industrial buildings, and some warehouse buildings and things like this, and still used some, uh, but it's more, it was more prevalent back in the 60s and 70s um, than uh, now that we've got the concealed fasten panel. Those are the ones we use most of the time. But there's still a panel that we need to consider. Um, the next one is a snap seam panel. Uh, this is a panel that can be used. Uh, it can have capacity in this type of a configuration with this got an inch and three quarter to two inch rib. Has a capacity to span between purlins, or it can be put down on a on a solid deck. Um, it's it's a hydrokinetic, and I'll talk about that in a minute. A hydrokinetic roof. It's not a completely weather seal roof. It has to have a, a, a weather barrier underneath of it uh, to be able to just like a shingle roof would to be able to take the moisture and get it off uh, off the roof. Uh, and it has to be at, at a uh, at least a three to four and twelve pitch, uh, because you can imagine with uh, snow buildup and things like this, since it's not a seam, even though there sometimes there is caulk in that in that lake, it still can have water that can seep in over it and and uh, and get inside, and that's why we need to have a, a full ice and water shield. Again, this is used a lot on banks and and small uh, buildings that would be high pitch, six, seven, eight, and twelve. Uh, roofs and it's a nice clean seam and everything and it can, it's used very very well in, in in those applications but it's a, it's kind of a boutique type panel uh, in, in my opinion for that now for the major roofs that we're going to we're going to be dealing with on the larger roofs anyway um, there's two different kinds this is what I call the fluted panel it's a, basically a 24 inch sometimes you can get a little uh, 18 inch panel but normally it's a 24 inch uh, uh, panel uh, it's got about a three inch rib on it and when it's seamed together then then uh, the female uh, leg goes over the male leg, and then it gets seamed together in a Pittsburgh seam, basically on the top, which is like the top of a Coke can, the best way I usually try to explain that. And you've got a solid surface um, to be able to, uh, it's like a single ply metal roof, if you will, in that case, uh, because we've got all the seams uh, are completely sealed. Uh, it's held down with, and I don't have this just for clarity, but it's held down with a concealed fastening clip that hooks on the male rib and then fastens to the structure with the fasteners being underneath the roof panel. So you don't see the fasteners um, except on, on the edges <coughs> of this type of a roof system. And uh, uh, and that seals it up uh, very nicely. These, this, this type of panel is very good and very useful uh, in, um, uh, in industrial work, large industrial projects. Uh, when you get into schools with a lot of hips and valleys and things like this, or uh, government buildings, this panel, the problem that we have with this panel is it, it develops a trapezoidal shape right here. When you put this seam and this seam together, you end up with a trapezoidal shape. And when you start cutting that at angles for valleys and hips and dormers and things like this, it's very hard to seal. Uh, we've done it on multiple occasions, but it's very hard to seal because you get an odd cut in there and you get an oblong uh, sealer, and if, even if you have a plug at the eave or whatever, uh, you'll get some expansion and contraction that will, will make that very difficult to seal to. So it's a great panel for long runs, long industrial buildings, long wings of buildings or whatever, um, uh, because it is wider. It uses it's a, it's a more efficient use of the metal and things like this. Uh, but uh, it's uh, it's a little difficult if you're going to use a, a panel in a uh, in, in a more of an aesthetic um, application. Um, but it does have good structural uplift, uh, and, and, and as does the next panel I'm going to talk to you about, which is the 16-inch um, uh, wide. This is uh, Steelox. The old arm, they're not around anymore. Armco Steelox developed this panel, and, and uh, this is the, um, the, the Steelox look-alike panel that most all, manu if not all manufacturers have. It's a 2-inch rib. 
it's, it's, it looks like the uh, snap seam panel, if you remember going back here, it looks like this panel, only it has a, a better seal, so we can use it in a hydrostatic and lower pitch applications. It still has a clip that fastens to the, um, the, the, to the male rib, and then, it fa and then it hooks to the male rib, and then it fastens to the structure here. So it's a concealed clip. And with that concealed clip, just like it is with the trapezoidal panel, that clip has a capacity to expand and contract. So it can, it can allow the, the panel to move and the fastening to the structure to stay permanent. And so you're not having any differential uh, movements that's not handled by the clip itself. The clips are two-piece clips, uh, and they'll handle the uplift, so they'll hold the panel down, and then they'll allow it also to be able to slide up and down the slope with, um, with expansion and contraction forces without having the problem like we had with the corrugated panels where we had the fastener, the structural fasteners going through the panels, <coughs> excuse me, and, and possibly loosening up or elongating the hole. So uh, this panel also gets power seamed, uh, and, the, and the female rib laps over the male rib, and then it gets, it gets seamed down. It can be seamed down to a full 180, or it can be seamed to a 90-degree angle. Uh, both of those are structurally sound. And again, we get the, the single-ply, uh, steel single-ply sheet when you get done with it, because it all, all ties together and provides one hydrostatic, uh, both this and the trapezoid one gives a hydrostatic uh, application for the, for the roof panel. So those are the those are the the uh, panels that we're gonna that, that we would I would suggest using and it's what's used in, in majority of the of the, the jobs. The last two are the ones are probably uh, 90 or 95 percent of the of the jobs that uh, that we run into in, in public work and in, in large uh, industrial work. That's what we run into. So um, I think that's what you'll see most of the time. Uh, we I have a preference to this one because it actually has a very good aesthetic look with the 16 inch wide. Uh, seams, they're vertical seams, and it's also really easy to flash around curves and things like this and retrofit applications. So uh, we end up using a, a lot of these in our specifications. <clears throat> All right, now we're going to talk about something that, that I may step on some toes here, and I'm not doing that uh, because I'm trying to be a know-it-all. I'm just going to tell you my experience with this, this type of a uh, of, a, of a, uh, a concept that we're going to talk about. One's hydrostatic and one's hydrokinetic. Now, one, the hydrostatic resists water infiltration even at low slopes. We can go down as low as a quarter of an inch and 12 inches with a metal roof. Uh, that's uh, all the warranties will, will warrant the work down to quarter inch and 12 inches, which is what a lot of uh, most of the, a lot of the single ply roofs uh, have also. So uh, it's not like you're going to see this roof on a large roof. It's not going to be uh, seen very much, but we can go down that low. But all edges for the hydrostatic, when all edges have to be sealed. With no, and it has no need for a water barrier then. And I'm going to show you some pictures on the next slide that's going to, sh to ex explain that. But we're going to seal everything. We're going to seal the, the uh, edges with uh, fasteners uh, that's going through tape caulk. And, uh, and then, but we're not going to have differential movement at that point. We're always going to allow the panel to go in one direction or the other. The hydrokinetic, on the other hand, is the same panels we talked about. You can do the, the, the um, the standard standing seam roofs that we just talked about, and you can use it in a hydrokinetic condition, and that's going to allow the water to infiltrate uh, during a, requiring a total water barrier below. It infiltrates if we're going to use hemmed edges and things like this. You get into uh, in, into valleys and whatever. Uh, it's going to allow the the panel to expand and contract in in very very vulnerable uh, weathering conditions. Um, so. Uh, we, we, we want to watch and use this. Again, this would be one that you could use in, in when you have small runs, uh, when you have, uh, uh, you are worried about some of the aesthetics, although I think you'll, um, I hope you'll agree with me that I don't think that the fasteners that we're talking about uh, to make them hydrostatic, and, and this is the way that roofs used to be made. All of them used to be, all of them were hydrostatic. Uh, and then we've got to where we wanted to try to maybe make them look a little bit better by hemming some of the edges. And I, I think we need to think about it. It may work in some cases, but we need to think about it because now with a hydrokinetic, you are depending on that the water is, you have to design the water is going to infiltrate, and you're going to have to have a total water barrier below that because you're, if not, you're going to have, you're going to have condensation, and uh, you can also have water infiltration over the ribs and at the ends. Um, you have to be at least three, three inches in, in, in 12 slope in all areas, including valleys and places like that, which sometimes get overlooked when they use the 3 and 12 um, figure. So that said, I'm going to show you a couple of them. 
left is a hydrostatic, and these are two roofs that were built identical. Uh, one of them, the hydrostatic, was built eight years before the hydrokinetic one was. This actually is an old steel ox roof panel before, um, uh, before they went out of business. Um, and you can see there's fasteners here. Now what you have is you have the panel actually stops at this point, and you have tape caulk on top of an eave strut, and you have the panel then, uh, then you have fasteners, zinc headed, solid head zinc headed fasteners with, with weather seal washers on them that fasten down through the panel, through the sealant, and into the, um, into the eave strut. And now the panel cannot move at this point. Uh, we're going to shove everything uphill. So all the expansion contraction is going to go uphill in this particular case. As opposed to the hydrokinetic on the right side, we don't have the fasteners. But unfortunately, we also don't have any sealant. We have the same eave strut. We have a J cleat uh, in there, uh, a cleat in there. Um, and, and, uh, and what we're going to have, and I'm going to skip ahead to one picture because this shows it actually better. This is the end of that same panel. What you have an inherent hole right here in the end of the panel that you can't close up. We can put, try to put caulk in there, and it's going to dry out because it's going to be exposed. It's going to fall out. And as the water, the water always comes down the inside ribs of the panels when, they're, when in a rain situation. It's not going to be in the middle of the panel. It's going to come down the leg of the panel. And when it gets here, it has a propensity to turn. Uh, we have uh, the cohesive forces will actually to, ask it to, 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 uh, to turn in there, pull it in there. When you have dew and stuff in the morning and you have just the water barely coming off especially, it will suck it right up in there over top of the cleat. And now you've got water coming down your wall on the inside. Now that, if you'll look over here, if you put that condition into a valley, this happens to be the hydrostatic valley of these two schools we talked about. No, no leaks in this school for 18 years with this. This roof was leaking after six years. Uh, and, and what we ended up doing is actually cutting these off and making this a hydrostatic and shoving everything to the top and putting a new ridge cap in uh, to be able and stop the leaks. So the problem, as I say, we got these long valleys like this. If you have a condition like this in a long valley, you get ice and water and everything that's going to get in, and snow that gets built up in here. And then when it starts to melt, it's going to start shoving itself in this location right here. It's going to start shoving itself inside. And it's a mess trying to track those down. So, so I'm, uh, the hydrostatic, is, as you can tell, is my preference. Uh, and that's the only way that we'll design them. Uh, the fasteners themselves. Um, I think we can look back here and see. This is a hydrostatic. And if you look real close from up high, you might see some of the fasteners. But from the ground, you see none of the fasteners. And if you get far enough away, um, you might see a few of these in the valley where it climbs out of the, out of the gutters. But it's, you can see even here, after you get eight or 10 panels away, it doesn't look any different than the uh, hydrokinetic. So I'm an engineer. I'm not trying to step on the uh, aesthetic issues of, of the architects in the audience today, but I think you ought to give this some thought. Give this some serious thought as to, uh, I, I don't think that you'll find that the aesthetic values are going to be degraded terribly by using a hydrostatic roof, and the hydrostatic roof will function uh, much better uh, in a weather tight condition than will the hydrokinetic. <laughs> All right, now, what kind of coatings are we going to use on these roofs? We've got metal. Uh, everybody's got granddaddy's barn that's rusted and, and uh, that was you know, 40 or 50 years old and started rusting and whatever when we used the galvanized roofs. We came up with a coating called galvalume in the 70s. And uh, recently, I was a part of a study that we did around the United States. And we said, let's go back and look at some of these roofs and see the actual galvalume coated roofs for 30 or 35 years. And we looked at 15 of them around the United States. And we did testing on them, and we, and we found out how well that they actually uh, would work. Not just question, but just trying to project how, but in 35 years, we figured out how well they're going to work. And the results were um, kind of uh, fantastic as far as the coatings. Um, so I'm going to talk about those for just, just a minute now. The basics of that is a galvalume coating is 55% aluminum, and it's 45% zinc. Uh, we, we tried to put aluminum coatings on in the 70s and found that it had some problems because it wouldn't cover the, the cut areas and, and uh, the ends of the panels and scratches and things like this because aluminum didn't flow. So they came up with uh, a, a, a mechanism where, method where we could have 55% aluminum and 45% zinc. So the zinc could do the flowing when you had scratches and minimal things like this, and the aluminum would actually protect the steel. It worked really well. Um, We've got, it has superior corrosion and resistance, and it heals those cut edges that we talked about, that I was talking about. 
the service life is well beyond. When we did our study, we wanted to see if it would last beyond the expectancy life uh, that's established by most uh, uh, most building um, uh, agencies, and they wanted buildings to last 60 years. Uh, but yet we're putting roofs on that's it's going to last 20 years. So in this case, we wanted to see, can we think that it'll last 30, 60 years? And when 35 years, it had used, in some cases, as little as 5%, some of them 15 or 20% of uh, of the coating, and those were in the aggressive uh, um, areas uh, up north. But um, but we found out that <clears throat> it's going to last well beyond the 60 years. The reality is that uh, without uh, much of a stretch, it's going to last well in the 100 to 150 years. These coatings will, unless we're in a um, uh, in a coastal condition. So anyway, uh, that's what we can we can expect out of the gal balloon, and it's it's uh, it's well published, uh, and I, it's in the 2014. Um, uh, and, and we had a, did this assessment. It's called the low slope unpainted 55% aluminum zinc alloy coated steel standing seam metal roof systems. It's produced by MCA Metal Construction Association, and uh, you'll find it on um, uh, Metal Architecture's website, uh, Metal Construction News website, on our website if you want to see it. Uh, there's a, it's a real lengthy, very uh, complicated, uh, with a lot of charts and things like this. Bottom line is the metal roof will cost about a third of what a conventional roof will cost over a 60-year life. Uh, that, you know, I, that's just the, and I'm going to show you a spreadsheet that will, will, will explain that, but that's the very bottom line that uh, we, we have with, if we can use a metal roof in an application like that. That's why we did the study. That's why the money was spent on this. It's an ASTM approved uh, study. We went through a lot of protocols with them and everything. And uh, and came up with some uh, some really interesting uh, information. I think you'd find that that interesting. <clears throat> All right, here's my field examples. Here's a couple of my jobs. This is the first metal retrofit roof that was done in the United States. Small roof in Wilmington, Ohio. Uh, and the reason it was done is because the owner I put a metal building up for the owner in 1978. And he said he found he's moving all his equipment back, and it was a standing seam metal roof, uh, back into here, uh, all of his finished product, because uh, inside his, his flat roof, it was leaking. Can you put a flat roof, uh, a pitched roof, on a, on a flat roof? And I said, no, of course. I was a young engineer, and he said, why? And I said, because it's never been done before. And he looked at me kind of quizzical, and I said, that's not a good answer, is it? He said, no, it's not. Figure it out. So I did. I figured it out and, and got way too much steel and whatever in there. I over-designed it. There's no question about it. But as of uh, three weeks ago, when I was up in that area, that roof is still there and it's still functioning. And it's uh, 30, actually it's closer to 38 years now uh, that it's been uh, working. So we've converted this into a slope roof that leaked into a, a I'm sorry, a flat roof that leaked into a slightly sloped roof that didn't. Same thing with this one. This was the first 110,000 square foot. This was a retrofit roof also, and it was done in 81, I think it is. So it's, uh, it is 35 years uh, old, and it's, um, it's still functioning just the way that it was, uh, it was in and installed. So that's uh, some Galvalume field exp uh, examples. Now, what if you don't want Galvalume? What if you don't want the shiny surface? OK, well, now you're going to paint it. So you, so you paint it. We put some Kynar paint on it. It's very good paint. Last anywhere from 20 to 35 years, we get warranties for that, but it goes right over the Galvalume, uh, Galvalume coating. <clears throat> all right, let's go through the warranties now. Uh, first of all, the one that's the, always been the most um, uh, talked about, I guess, is weather tightness warranty. I'm, I'm going to be very blunt with you. Don't just put a line in your in your specification and say warranty, winter weather tightness warranty, 20 years, and then go on to the next section because you're going to get a 20-year weather tightness warranty, and it's not going to be really worth the paper it's written on. And I hate to say that. All the manufacturers, all the good manufacturers have good warranties, but you've got to ask for them. What are you looking for? Well, we want a special weather tightness warranty for the standing seam roof. We don't, the manufacturers is going to have a, a repair it, and they're going to replace it with, within a specified period. Everybody knows that, but we need to know 20 years. We need to have a liability limit. We, and my opinion is we need to have at least the contract cost of the installed metal roof. You can always also go to what they call an NDL, a no dollar limit warranty. They really like to charge you for those. Those are, those are very exceptional. But if you get a half a million dollar roof and you get a half a million dollar um, um, limit on the liability, you'll never, uh, you'll never spend that kind of money uh, to do anything. I mean, we've been in a lot of lawsuits and a lot of situations, even when they have to be uh, sometimes replaced, usually you can replace right over them, and it doesn't cost as much as the original contract. So you're going to be covered with that if, in fact, you had to 
um, <clears throat> had to do that. So make sure that liability limit, that's one of the first things that gets missed. Somebody says, here's my, here it is, I'm going to give you a warranty, I'm going to charge you 10 cents for it, and it's going to have 5 cents a square foot uh, liability. Well, you know, you're, it, it doesn't make sense. But that's what it'll still satisfy as a 20-year weather tightness warranty. So make sure that you look at that. It also needs to be inspected. If they don't inspect it, if the manufacturer doesn't inspect it, and I'm not picking on the manufacturers, there's a lot of good ones out there, but if they don't inspect it, then they can always say, well, you didn't install it the right way, so therefore we're going to walk away from it. Make sure that they install it. Pay for the warranty enough. If you're going to have a warranty, make sure that you've, uh, you've got enough in there uh, that they're going to come out and do a pre-installation conference approximately halfway through and at the finish of the roof. Maybe they want more. Yeah, they can have more. Maybe they can get by with two to, for experienced installers. That's fine. I mean, but you need to have them out there to where at the end of the job they're going to say, we saw it, we're going to issue the warranty, it's going to be at least the contract cost of the installed metal roof, and, and we're good to go. And then you've got something that you can work with uh, in, uh, in lawsuits if you happen to get into one of those. Hopefully you won't. You also have to have an installer training program for the, uh, from the manufacturer because you have to have, you know, you can't just take any contractor to do that. And then have them supply a list of those contractors that you can put in your specs. So you can do it in your addenda. You can send them out and say, okay, we've got three manufacturers, and here's uh, three or four uh, contractors from each one of the manufacturers that have been pre-approved for their uh, weather tightness warranty. They'll do all that stuff before, this, before uh, you put the bids out. Everybody was very, very understanding and will be able to do that before the bids go out. And then uh, issue a spec and compliant material and weather tightness warranties. That's what the manufacturer has to do. We've got to make sure the manufacturer doesn't quip on it after the fact and after the bids are, uh, the, the smoke's cleared from the bids, and then they say, oh, no, we didn't really think that that's what you wanted. We're going to give you this type of warranty. Everybody's uh, easy to get along with before the, the dollars get on the table. So make sure that you get all this stuff taken care of before you get to the bid. For the, for the warranty on the paint, again, 20 to 35 years. It's usually peel, crack, and fade warranties. Um, they're going to fade with. They always all fade a little bit within a certain range. The Kynar paints work very well, and they stay for a long time. So, um, uh, special colors may be, may have a variable warranty on it. So, make sure you understand that if you want a special color. Uh, watch the pass-through warranties. The quill coaters give a warranty uh, for the um, uh, uh, for the paint, uh, but watch through that the, there's not exceptions in there. Watch for the special exclusions that only protect the coil coder. And you'll see that. I don't have enough time to go in that uh, on a, on a one-hour webinar today, but watch that and make sure that this, uh, that this is going to be in the, in the owner's best interest. Again, before the bid, everybody's willing to make changes in their warranties before the bid, and they're very, very difficult to get done after the bid. Um, Make sure you get the coil tags. Doesn't seem like I've run into that before many times uh, on all kinds of sides of the problem. If there was a problem, if you don't have the coil tags, everybody looks, uh, everybody gets dumb and they've lost them, and then nobody knows where they are. If you've got the coil tags or the invoices identifying the actual coils, then you've got a good. And I've been successful in several cases where we've got uh, new roofs where the paint did did come off. Only happened a couple times, but when they did come off, but I had to have these invoices or the coil tags, and it was, it was difficult to get. So make sure you get those in the in the specifications, and then uh, and maintain, make sure that the architect, you, and the owner both maintain the, the the paint warranty. A lot of times in lawsuits, first thing that's gone is there's no warranties. Uh, we don't have a warranties, and the manufacturers walk out of the room with that case. Make sure that there's one just to protect the owner, and hopefully we never have to use it. Galvaloom warranties are very similar. I'm not even going to go through that. Very, uh, it's, uh, it's valid for 20 to 25 years, although now we know it will last over 100 years. Will they, will they extend their warranties more than that? I don't know. Uh, all we could do is the studies and, and show uh, how long they actually will last. Uh, same thing, pass through warranties and, and make sure that you uh, maintain the, the uh, Galvaloom warranty in case there is a claim. So same thing that I just went over with the, uh, with the paint warranties. All right, now sometimes people say, why are you going to include this in, in uh, what we're talking about? I don't want to worry about that. We're going to have a pre-construction meeting. We'll try to have that, but sometimes we won't because of the, you know, the schedules and we can't get everybody together and whatever. Terribly important. Big mistake if you don't have a pre-construction meeting. Include everybody, owner, architect, owners, insurer, if applicable, uh, testing, inspection agency, metal roof panel installer, manufacturer, you know, anybody you can get out there that's going to be involved in that, make sure you get them there so we can get everybody on the same page again before the work starts. Everybody's going to start fighting after that, so make sure everybody's on the same page so we can all work together. 
Uh, look at the construction schedule. Make sure the materials and labor is going to be available. Remove, re <coughs> review their methods and procedures. M make sure the deck substrate's right. That's a big problem sometimes where there's, there's, uh, the deck's not, not level and everybody wants to point fingers at everybody else. Now's the time. You got the steel up. You got the deck on a new roof anyway. You got the deck up. Take a survey. Go out there and make, look, make sure you're looking at it and everything's fine before you start putting the, the uh, insulation down. And then, then it's too late. Then we're starting to hide things at that point. Uh, make sure you review the loading um, limitations of the deck during and after the roofing. You want to make sure you don't overload uh, that. Review the flashing and special roof details. Those are terrible. I can't talk enough about how important those are. But make sure everybody understands them. And we're not going to just do them on the fly and try. Well, we'll figure it out when we get there. Let's, let's talk about it in the job trailer before we get out on the roof. Um, review the governing regulations and requirements. Those are that's that's standard temporary protection. There's always some of that we have to deal with. Everybody needs to know what's going to go on, how we're going to observe it, how we're going to repair uh, if if we do have a problem uh, uh, with the panel or something. Uh, arrange for follow-up monthly progress meetings. We need to keep everybody on in the loop, so we need to have those. Document proceedings and present it to all participants. We don't want to hide anything. Everybody needs to be on the same team with this situation. All right, now I'm going to talk specifically about the installation, and the reason is. This right here, the majority of the metal roof problems, I almost say all of them, but I'm going to say the majority of the metal roof problems and lawsuits arise from faulty installation. It's not the specifications. It's not the panels. It's that it got installed improperly. And, and, and I, I, it makes me sick to my stomach sometimes when I see some of them. I thought, man, if we just somebody had been out here watching over them and make sure that they got it installed right, then we wouldn't have this problem. Um, the metal roofs have been designed and, and manufactured for decades and they know how to do that. They know how to put the gavel in on, they know how to put the paint on them, but, but now we get them in the field and that's where some mistakes are made. Use an experienced contractor with train crews, no exceptions. Don't just let them sub it to somebody that used to do some shingles and they think they can do metal. It's, uh, again, it's the owner's roof. Make sure that you take care of the owner. Contractor and crew should be certified if there's a weather tightness warranty. Not afterwards. It doesn't do any good to get certified afterwards, which I've seen tried before. Make sure they're certified and they've got their certification before they start the work. Use a pre-qualification process if possible. So, uh, here in North Carolina, we have that's got watered down over the last few years, <clears throat> but we still try to do that uh, to try to before accepting the contractor's bid because because after the bid's accepted, then then all of a sudden we see subs show up and we see different people showing up and and we've, we're not getting what we thought we paid for on bid day. Uh, we need to make sure that that's tied down, if, all, if at all possible, through a pre-qualification process, either before the bid or immediately after the bid, a very thorough one after the bid, uh, before the contracts are left. Uh, then, then we need to have a qualified metal roof inspector the, to watch the job as it goes up. You know, uh, from an architect standpoint or from the engineer standpoint, at least monthly to have meetings. Uh, more so if we've got a. a uh, a less experienced crew, but we've got to make sure that we're watching this. It goes down, and of course, then I, I, I recommend strongly that we have three inspections from the uh, from the manufacturer that's issuing the weather tightness warning. Just make sure everything's done, and then we don't have to go back. Then nobody needs to hire us to do uh, to, to do law suit work. Suit work. We can make sure that uh, uh, that they get done that down to start with, and that's what I would prefer. Um, then the weather tight, as I say, issuer should be required to visit the job as much as they feel is necessary, but at least three times. Common areas for the incorrect installation, use non-specified details. They're making them up in the field. Oh, we got in a situation, we're not sure what to do, so let's just lap it and cock it and put some screws in it. Uh, that's, that's not the way to do it. Improper sealant location, you've got to put this in this very obvious where the sealant needs to go. The, the shop drawing should show that. Uh, improper, incorrect clip locations. Um, and uh, and that I, I, on new roofs, I've had two or three roofs had to be replaced because they just put the clips down wherever, and then you find out they got them nine foot on center and they're supposed to be 13 inches on center in the corner zones. There's no way you can fix it. There's no way to fix it except put a new roof on. You don't want that to happen. You can see it as it goes down. Somebody's got to be be watching it. Improper insulation of curbs, stacks, valleys, perimeter details. Those are all terribly uh, terribly important. Also, all right. What about retrofit? <clears throat> Well, I'm not going to go into the, to a lot of the details because we don't have time in this, in this webinar, but you can add pitch to a flat roof like this picture shows here. If you can see that, I'm sorry if you're sitting on this on, on a smaller screen, but you can add pitch to a flat roof by merely putting a clip in, tying to the existing structure, using a variable height clip, then putting a purlin across the top of the variable height uh, post. I'm sorry, I said clip instead of post, and uh, putting some bracing in there 
and then putting a metal roof on top of it. Here's some of the framing down here in the bottom right-hand corner uh, that, that shows the bracing and the purlins and the posts and the clips. There's four or five components in there. It's got to be done right. You've got to look at the existing structure. You've got to watch what you're doing and know how to temporarily seal some of these, uh, these clips so you don't drown the, the customer out while you're doing it. But you can convert that flat roof into a pitched roof and uh, a pitched metal roof, and you've got a lot longer longevity of that roof than you will with, uh, with any of the flat roofs that are on the market today. <clears throat> All right, sustainability of a metal roof. This, I always stuck this slide in. I don't have a lot of time left, but I'm going to get through this. The average lifespan of most commercial roofs is only 17 years. Who says that? NRCA. They did that for the roof depreciation legislation two years ago, and they, they, uh, they said the average roof, they said this, I didn't, is 17 years. We find that they're anywhere from 15 to 25 years in most cases, even including shingles, uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less, but a lot less than the 60 years that, uh, that it should be. This is a definition from a guy um, that uh, I've got on a blog. It says, sustainability is defined as a requirement of our generation to manage the resource base such that the average quality of life that we ensure ourselves can potentially be shared by all future generations. Now, I think that's kind of important. And, uh, and then Abraham Lincoln, I thought, was very interesting. He said, you cannot escape the responsibility of tomorrow by evading it today. So evading it today would mean let's put something down that's not going to last as long, uh, and we know we're not going to have to deal with it uh, tomorrow or the next day, but then we're going to have to deal with it soon, uh, and sometime in the next few years, and then we're that's not really, uh, that's, that's escaping the responsibility of tomorrow by evading it today. You cannot do that. And so I'm trying to, to, to explain why the metal roofs, in my opinion, would last to a point to where we won't be evading, escaping the responsibility. We'll actually be taking on that responsibility with our infrastructure, which is a big item in our in our in our um, country right now. So um, that said, then this is what we can do. Just very simple. And I'm going to skip through. We can look at this, but we got a clip. We got a pearl that's running this way. We got bracing. We got posts. We got insulation and a metal panel. Put a wall panel on this, and now we've converted a flat roof into a slope roof. How, how's that going to work? Is that going to make sense? And I'm not going to go through all these numbers, so don't panic and don't, and don't uh, fall asleep now on me. I'm going to tell you what we've done is we've, we've got this uh, cost, and these are on costs from a year and a half ago. We went through and, and, and developed costs on what it's going to cost to do different things. A flat membrane roof. Chuck, I'm, uh, I'm going to interrupt just one quick moment to remind everybody that they'll be able to get this, download this chart so they can see it more clearly. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Now, I'm going to go right here. This is what it's going to cost a metal roof. Uh, if you're adding pitch to a slope roof on 60,000 feet, it's going to, over 60 years, it's going to cost $876,000, $2.5 million if, it's, uh, if, it's, uh, if you're going to maintain a flat membrane roof. If it's going to cost 486, if it's a shingled roof, <clears throat> this gets covered with metal, $1.5 million <clears throat> if, in fact, you're going to maintain the shingle roof and continue to replace them and maintain them. You can look at those numbers later, and please call me if you've got any questions on those. I'll send you the spreadsheet, put in your own numbers, see how it comes out. <clears throat> All right, here's what a finished metal roof looks like. This is an accounting we've done uh, a long time ago. Uh, we've done over, um, uh, over $10 million worth of work in this county uh, over the last uh, 13 years, I believe it is. They're covering their entire, this is one of the first ones we did. Okay, this is going to be their uh, forever. Uh, that's on a, now new roofs. This is a nice condo job in, in Maryland. Uh, same thing. It's going to have this actually is a snap seam panel in this case, but it's a high pitch. It's five and twelve. Works fine in an application like this. Galloon paint uh, coated and uh, and painted. Uh, this is a school. We did six of them here in Wake County where I live. Uh, they're all about 22 years old now. Um, never, there's no leaks. There's nobody. No reason to go back. Um, um, never been a warranty claim or anything like this. I'm not saying that we did it. We did it right. I'm not bragging on ourselves by any means. But the metal panel will last. It's not even scratching the surface to last uh, 20 years. Um, that I'm done, uh, Paul. I'll turn it back to you. Thanks very much, Chuck. Great presentation. Certainly appreciate it. I, we ha we have several questions here. So um, first of all, before we get into the questions, I wanted to thank Firestone again for supporting making this webinar possible. Um, and you can see there Chuck's contact information. He encouraged you to follow up with him a couple of times 
Um, and uh, a reminder that you're going to be able to download this presentation so you can dig into it a little bit. I know for some of you the, the screen was a little bit small. Uh, sorry about that, but uh, you can get the slides and, and, and review them again, as well as uh, if you wanted to, uh, you could uh, go view this on our videos page. Uh, I'll probably have that up for you tomorrow, so you could go back and review different sections if you wanted to. Um, first, hey Chuck, I got a good question here from uh, somebody who's in the in the hydrokinetic where you were talking about having water infiltration. He wanted uh -huh. you to address the idea of using a hook system instead of a, a through fastening system right there at the eave. Um, is a hook system something you use? Well, the hook system can, and sometimes it's used in the valleys uh, where they'll use a jake fleet and it'll be an actual hook and they'll put a bead of caulk in there to try to impede the water. Uh, and on, a, on an edge, on an eave condition, it, it, it will work relatively well. It will work relatively well. It still won't close up the ends of those panels that I talked about because in, inherently on in every panel you have to bend it down and they're not going to meet. They're not going to seal up the flats where you bend those, uh, the panel itself over. They're not going to meet. So you always have a hole where the water can and it will pull right up the inside of that rib. Um, and you could put some caulk in there and stuff and it helps some, but, uh, but in a valley condition, uh, a hook system uh, just doesn't work. And, and the reason is because the ice, the freeze and thaw in that will shove that apart and it'll lift those panels up and it'll lift the hook up and then when it comes down then it'll force the water, the hydrostatic will find a hole in there that'll push through. They're really hard to find. Uh, I've, I've had to track a lot of this, so it's really difficult to find them in there. It's better. It's better than just a regular cleat system, but it still has some, uh, some problems. Great. Um, and I wanted to, to address the certified installer issue. Somebody had a question. Uh, Richard had a question about that. Uh, I know you, you, you did say that uh, a roof should be uh, installed by a certified installer always from the manufacturer. Is that just written in stone? Yes. Yes, the, all the manufacturers, I'm sorry, all the manufacturers that have weather tightness warranties that count for anything uh, will have a certified installer program. Now, I can't verify, I've, I've taught a lot of those, but I can't verify that the, the, how they're going to teach them and how strict they're going to be and whether they're going to give a test or anything like that. Uh, but I can say that if they at least have a certified program and certify them prior to the work being done, then if you happen to get into a claim situation, lawsuit, or a problem situation, and if you if, if you call, I'm called in to, to to litigate to help litigate that, and I've got a warranty, and I say, okay, you certify this guy, you let him install it, you inspected his work, now you can't walk away from your weather tightness warranty liability. If he doesn't have the certify certification, then you can say, well, the contractor hired a subcontractor and put my product down, and so then I'm going to wash my hands of it. You didn't do what you're supposed to do. That's the reason, I, even if it's not a good program, as long as it's certified by that manufacturer, it gives you a lot more, it gives you a lot more, um, uh, it gives you a lot more information, uh, a lot more uh, uh, work. It's got a lot, lot more stuff that you can do to, to make it work out for you and your, and your um, uh, to your benefit. Sorry, I lost my words there at the end, but yeah. Good, good. No, um, we, I got a ton of questions here, and I'm afraid some of them are kind of want, want to do entire evaluations on uh, roof systems that uh, I'll encourage people to follow up with Chuck directly on some of that if you'd like to get a little bit of uh, information on some of this stuff. But let me ask this next one from Cameron uh, about hydrostatic uh, roof valley where you're using exposed fasteners. How do you make them watertight? And um, then kind of follow up, does the thermal expansion contraction cause a failure in that situation? Well, the thermal expansion contraction is going to start there, Cameron, and it's going to move to the high point, to the ridge or the high side, whatever it is. And then that flashing has to be able to be designed to where it, it, it can move. But now you're moving it at, a, at the high side where the water starts draining, not at the low side where the water is gathering. Uh, and in answer to the fasteners, there are some zinc-headed fasteners that have that have uh, concealed washers, or they have washers on that have concealed um, uh, areas underneath them where it's, it's recessed, and the washers actually suck up into that wash, up into the, 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 the rubber washer sucks up into the steel washer that's attached to the head of the fastener. And if anybody call me, I could tell them there's, all the manufacturers have this type of a fastener. Uh, and it's not, if it's a loose fastener, then you can over over screw it, and it can spread it out, and it can split the fastener. If it's a if it's a if it's a washer that's attached to it, then it's going to spin with the the head of the fastener. When it gets down to the metal, it's going to spin a little bit, but then it's going to stop. And then you have this this EPDM 
um, closure on the inside of it that makes it a very, very weather tight condition. And then and there's also on the top of those, they have a, a now the new fasteners the last 10 years, you get one with it's got a little V kink in the top, um, the top thread of that fastener. When it goes and makes that last, last turn into the steel, it will allow it to, it's very, very difficult to get it out. You have to take a tool to actually get it to back out. So you don't have the back out that you had, and you don't have the fastener um, spalling that we used to have with uh, just the flat washers. So there's a way to be able to do that and make that completely watertight. Thanks, Chuck. And I got one uh, last question we'll, we'll squeeze in here and on fasteners. Most of the manufacturers require that very specific fasteners be used with their products in order to get the warranty, right? It's, it's not just yes. Yes. Go, to the, go to the hardware store and pick out fasteners out of a bin. You've got to use exactly what they say. That's true. The, the only thing, a caveat to that is that in my experience as a contractor, uh, and I let our contractors do it for in jobs that we've got specified, is, is if you'll get a letter from the manufacturer and say, these are the fasteners we're going to use, but we'd like to buy them ourselves, the manufacturer has never had one push back. Because they don't manufacture those, they pass those through, and they really don't care as long as you're using the good fasteners. But in the specifications, you will specify the size of the fastener, where they're going to be used, the type of the fasteners, uh, that they're going to be included in the weather tightness warning, all this type of stuff, and the type of caulk that you're going to use uh, as well as the fastener. So, so yes, they will, they will have a, a, what they want, but they'll usually let the contractor, especially on big jobs or contractors that do a lot of this, which is the ones I'd like to use, uh, they'll be buying it in bulk, and the manufacturers will allow them to do that as long as they need. And then what we ask for is a letter from the manufacturer. You're going to use these fasteners. The manufacturer is okay with it beforehand. Great. Well, Chuck, thank you very much. I enjoyed the presentation. It was, really, it was wonderful, and thank you all for sitting in with us. Um, again, look for the follow-up. Uh, you're welcome to send emails to me. If you have any questions, I'll pass them along to Chuck, or you can contact him directly. But uh, thank you all very much, and uh, we'll talk to you next time. Thank you. Yes, thanks very much.